Hey everyone, welcome back to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. So I am excited about today's topic for a kind of a selfish reason. This is something that I am looking forward to hopefully learning more about and um, starting uh, the skill myself over the next year. We'll see how the time frame works out. But um, that skill is tanning. And it's something that I hadn't really ever thought about. You know, we do all these other old fashioned homestead skills, but tanning hides was something that just never occurred to me until uh, my husband and I were talking about how to really make the most of the cattle that we raise and we sell and we have processed. And so we were, you know, scheming things to do with the fat and the bones and the organs. And then we were like, why have we never thought about using the hides? And so it kind of started me down this rabbit trail of research. And in that, I discovered there's a lot of information out there and it started to feel really overwhelming. So I am thrilled to have today's guest, um, Cher Raynan. Did I say your last name correctly? You did. Nailed it. I did. Okay. Yay. Of Wild Fiber Organic Tannery. Uh, she is the expert in this and I cannot wait to have this conversation um, and ask her all my questions. So welcome, Cher. Thank you for having me. So maybe just give everybody a little bit of background on you um, and kind of how you got into this world of, of tanning and what you do up there in Canada. Well, I got into this much like you. I had a farm and really just kind of approached it from a whole animal use perspective, right? You know, so much care we put into our animals. And uh, for me, I started with Angora rabbits and I was into the fiber and then I had sheep and, you know, it just naturally evolved and got bigger. And uh, when people started seeing what I could do, especially with the sheep, I raised Icelandics and uh I started shipping sheepskins all over North America. Wow. Yeah. So I started the tannery in 2018 and it's been my full-time gig and growing ever since. That is amazing. That is amazing. Um, wow. So you primarily do sheep now and rabbit do, or do you, what other um, types of hides do you Well, actually on? I do everything now. Um, okay. Yeah. I I can do everything from wild small animal furs all the way up to beef and bison. So uh, I have workshops on all types of tanning. Okay. Yes. And I, I have some questions on that because yeah. I was reading some, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I was reading some um, websites that are like, don't start with beef. And I'm like, oh no, because <laughs> that's what I have. <laughs> right. But well, I, yeah. yeah, I'd love to get your perspective. Yes. But um, I guess my first question is, you know, I have a, we have a lot going on. We run the farm and we're doing businesses and we have lots of other chores and homestead ventures. Yeah. Is it over ambitious to think that I could put tanning into that, those existing skill sets that we have and that we're actively working on? Um, I did. That's how I started. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're not, you're not working the hide for two weeks straight or one week straight. You have like one step that you work on for 10 minutes here and there and you just keep checking it. Right. So it's yeah. not, it's not something that's going to, um, really intrude on your routine at all. Okay. So it's kind of like probably cooking from scratch. Some of the slow right. foods like sourdough, exactly. a little bit yes. here, leave it. Okay. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. I know I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so can, could a beginner do a cow hide or should we, should someone like me start with something smaller? Uh, you know, I'll stick, I'll stick with the consensus. <laughs> you should start with something smaller. Um, okay. that's going to set you up for success, but you know what? I love the ambition. Uh, that's why <laughs> all of my workshops are for beginners. Um, so it's just, you're just jumping in and it's not something like beef hides you don't want to do by yourself. Right. So okay, you do kind of want to have an understanding and maybe the science behind like why you're doing each step and what the end result should be. Cause um, there's no hard and fast rules with tanning. Like every hide is going to be different. There's so many variables that until you really understand why you're doing each step, you're going to run into challenges, especially with the bigger hides and knowing what they need to have done for. Okay. And so does it, Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry. Um, does it come down to more the, like size why that would be harder for a beginner or is it just like the the thickness or the technique that's different um all of the above so the, all, size, okay. the size of it uh because there are going to be steps where uh we need to get it wet right and those big hides you're not going to be able to pick up out of the wash water just by yourself um 
Okay. And of course, like the the thinning involved, but you can do that at different stages to make it easier. Um, yeah, there's just a, like more elbow grease that goes into the bigger hides that require more than just one person. It's not necessarily something that you can just tackle in your living room. Should make sense. <laughs> yes. So what would you, yeah, totally. I, I'm picturing that. It's yeah. not, not a pretty sight. <laughs> Me wrestling a beef hide in the living room. I'm going to hold off on that. Um, what would you suggest like a rat would rabbits be good yeah. for someone who's just like brand new? Absolutely. Uh, you know what? Okay. They're like, they're super easy to find, uh, or race, right? Um, uh, mm -hmm. rabbits are good. I have a lot of people asking me, you know, are small animals easier than the larger hides? The smaller animals, they're just a little more tedious. You got to make sure you don't rip them. They're a little bit more fragile. Um, you know, I would even say jump in on a sheepskin if if you want to okay. get into the big hides, but you don't want something um, like more than you can manage on your own. Everybody, well, not everybody, but most people can manage a sheep hide on their own. I'm seeing a lot of those too. Um, so that makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Would you hear another, this might be a really stupid question. I'm not a sheep person. I have not had much experience <laughs> with them. Can you do like, would like a regular sheep, like the, just your run of the mill sheep, or do you need like the kind of the Icelandic type with the more of the hair? Um, you know what? It all depends. Like if it feels nice when it's on the animal, uh, test it okay. out, you know, if it's soft okay. and it's something that, that you want to preserve, that's really going to dictate whether that's something you want to use or not. Uh, there's so many different breeds of sheep and people don't even know all the different breeds of sheep. Um, yeah. But yeah, depending on its use, you're going to want to really pay attention to the wool lengths, right? If it's a rug, you want it something that you can maintain and clean. Um, so you might not want it to be the dramatic Icelandic 12 inch long wool. Sure. Yeah. 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 Although I've seen some, I don't know if they're 12 inch, but I've seen some of those on in pictures in homes and they're, they're so gorgeous they're, when it's like layered and draped. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. On a chair. They're, they're really amazing. Yes. <laughs> yes on a chair <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So can you walk us through like the pro the process also, but actually maybe we should talk about the different types because when I started Googling, I was there was people talking about all these chemicals and then there was brain tanning and there was uh, bark. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And I, I started to kind of, you can correct me if I'm wrong, pick through. And I realized there seemed to be like the industrial commercial method. And then there was like the traditional method. And I was automatically drawn to the traditional methods because they seemed less harsh and just more common sense. So yes. could you compare and contrast those options that we would have to pick from? Uh, yeah, there, there's a definite contrast. Uh, the commercial methods, of course, are using a chemical cocktail. Um, I've read, but I, I'm not an expert in commercial processes, but I've read that uh, the wastewater that comes out of the commercial tanneries is toxic. Um, it's not something that I want on my property, you know, with animals and gardens and whatnot. Um, everything that I do here, I want to make sure is safe for my septic system, can be dumped in the yard, nobody's going to get sick or injured from it. Um, so yeah, those are the immediate differences. Also, the leather quality um, I find quite a bit different from commercially tanned versus brain tanned. Um, and I can't speak to bark tanned because honestly, I've never done it. I've never had a reason to. Um, I am very much a believer in using all of what the animal provides. And that's why I stick to brain tanning. It's already there. Um, then I lost my train of thought. That's okay. It happens. <laughs> We can edit out anything we need to. So, okay. Uh, right. Those are the differences. Okay. Um, right. So yeah, commercially tanned leathers, I find actually, uh, are more susceptible to ripping, uh, brain tan leathers mm. actually seem to be quite a bit more durable, a lot more strong. Um, and I, I'm not sure why that is. Um, if it's a, specific uh commercial process that they're using but it almost makes the leather kind of fibrous and it can tear pretty easy actually interesting yeah. okay um if someone isn't 
like for us, we, in order to sell our beef, I know Canada is different, but in order to sell our beef, we have to have our animals processed in a USDA facility. Yes. Um, and so we're not butchering at home, those animals. So again, I know Canada has different rules. Is it difficult to usually get the brains from a, a butcher in Canada, at least? Uh, Do you know? Um, you know what? So I- I think it depends on the facility. Um, okay. I've been advocating uh, to try to be able to purchase brains, um, and it is challenging. And the challenge comes in with the uh, the food inspection regulations. They cannot store the heads, um, mm-hmm. and I think they just don't really want to get into the process of extracting and packaging brains, but uh, they can't store the heads in the freezers with meat. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. So they would have to harvest the brains immediately, which is, that's what my husband was like. He's like, I don't, cause we're friends with our butcher down the road. Yes. And he's like, I don't think he's going to want to like extract the brains. That's like a whole thing. And I'm like, well, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Unless, unless you can convince them to let you pick up the same day and some of the smaller butchers will, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it, it, it can be a good source, but you want to be able to get a good relationship with your local butcher to have access okay. to that. Yeah. So any other tricks if someone is looking for brains? Any other tricks? <laughs> other than butch- butchering uh, so, yourself, maybe, huh? Yeah, there's there's actually some alternatives. Um, so with brain tanning, what we're actually wanting, uh, why we use the brain is because there's this chemical called lecithin that's naturally occurring in the brain. And when that combines with the tannins in the smokewood, that actually makes a permanent a uh, chemical reaction and it's a true tan. So that soft leather is now permanent, water resistant, washable. Um, so there are different forms of lecithin. You will find lecithin in egg yolks. You will also find uh, some plant-based lecithin such as soy lecithin. Um, I try to stay away from the soy just because of the crops. They're highly... Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, I, I try to stick with the animal base. Um, I actually, I did end up making my own tanning powder that's shelf stable because of the difficulty trying to get brains or sometimes they don't have enough. So uh, the tanning powder that I make is animal based and I'll, I'll use that to top up brains or I'll even use it as a standalone. So there's some alternatives. Okay. You don't have to have brains to brain tan to still achieve the same results. Okay. That makes me feel better. And not that I, I mean, I would love to use brain if it's available, but yes, that could, yeah, there's a hurdle there. Yeah. Even I okay. out. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so can, is that tanning powder available for purchase or is that? Yes. Okay. You t- okay. Awesome. All right. We'll get all your links and your um, contact info at the end. So yeah. we'll direct people <laughs> to your stuff. That's awesome. Can you use eggs? I, I think I saw some websites talking about eggs. Um, you can, you can use, and it's just the egg yolk. Um, so when okay. you're using just egg yolk or one of the other like, um, less than alternatives, um, it, it will give you the true tan, but it won't give you the soft, buttery, soft leather as real brains. And the reason for that is because brains have this perfect ratio of fat. And the plant-based or just the egg yolks don't have that same ratio or any fat at all. So that's why uh, I really made it a point and a priority to start making an alternative that will still give me the exact same results as using brains. So that's, that's it's the just, yeah. behind it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so amazing. I, the, the brains are so perfectly formulated for that. They it just really are. blows my mind. Yeah. That's so cool. And is it true that one animal, the brains of one animal is about enough to tan the hide or do you get some Um, discrepancy there? Yeah. Uh, as a general rule, yes. Uh, each animal has enough brain matter to tan its own hide except for bison. Um, yeah, (laughs) they are quite interesting. (laughs) Not large enough. Okay. (laughs) Smaller brains. Yeah. And you can even, you can use brains from another species of animal. It doesn't have to be the same. Uh, you can use a mixture of brains and egg yolk or a mixture of brains and any one of the other substitutions. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. All right. 
Okay, so we've established that the we're going with brain. Yeah. I think that that's what I've been drawn to anyway. Yeah. Um, can you walk us through the process from the animal is is butchered, we have the hide, and then how do we get to the end? Right. Uh, for which animal? Because it's going to be um, different for all of them. It's going to be different. Yeah. Let's. Could we do like a smaller animal and then yeah. we could, could then we talk through the cattle and kind of contrast them? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, small animals. Uh, I do small animal workshops often. Uh, Usually we do rabbits or um, anything all the way up to a coyote. So like a fox or a fisher. I'm not sure if you guys have those down there. Um, Some places. Yeah. And so those are prepped. Actually, I have have some. I have this this little Martin here. So... um, they're skins and they're inside out. They, we just peel them off um, from the animal. And then we put them on these boards. It's called a forming board. And we make sure that there's no real thick bits of fat or anything. And they dry on these boards. Once they're fully dry, they're, um, they're like shelf stable as long as there's no critters getting at them. But there's still going to be like a membrane on there. Um, they are preserved being dry, so you can stack them up until you're ready to start tanning them. But we dry scrape the membranes off. And uh, I just use these little antler tools. And we literally just scrape the membrane off until um, just the skin is exposed. And because that membrane will actually stop the penetration of the brain solution so once all the membrane is removed then we're going to hydrate it with the brain solution and once it's hydrated we're going to literally just start pulling the skin every which way and as it's drying and we're stretching it it's going to hold that stretch so you end up with this really soft flexible leather and uh, once it's fully dry, then we smoke it and that sets the tan. And then we'll give it a final wash after, uh, usually just to get that extra smoky smell out of the hide. But uh, in a nutshell, it's done. Okay. So That's, we can do those yeah. in a weekend. Okay. And I, oh, and yeah, I can see how that would be. The small is beneficial at the beginning because that seems a lot easier you're just yeah you're for those of you listening to audio you might want to go uh at least watch this part of the episode on youtube because she's holding up the martin on a stick so you can see what it looks like (laughs) so it's helpful the visual is very helpful um okay so and then you have the hair on hide pelt right and then you're ready it's ready for whatever you're going to do with it yeah, so I'll so so the larger hair on hides, I'll use sheep as, as an example. Um, so you skin them. Now you have a couple options. You can either freeze that hide because you can't deal with it right away, or you can go straight into salting it. Um, I like to salt all of my like medium to large hides. Um, and the reason for that one is because it saves me freezer space. I have lots of freezers naturally, but, uh, hides take up a lot of space. So usually I'll just go straight to salting. Um, and the salt actually makes a membrane release easier. So it's easier for flushing. Yeah. Um, you should be able to flush out a sheep in an hour or less. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Even a beginner should be able to do it like an hour. Um, so I let it sit under salt for about a week. Um, and the way that I do it, so there's salt curing where you just lay it flat and salt it and it dehydrates. It's like cardboard. That's for long-term storage. Um, I salt it and I will fold the sides into the center and roll and it holds that salt in there. So it's preserved. Uh, the hair is not going to slip out but it still retains enough moisture that actually uh, flushing it is super easy. So you don't want it fully dehydrated because then you just have to rehydrate it before you flush it. Um, But once flushing is done, then you're going to, um, usually with sheep, they have lanolin. So I give it a degrease bath and I throw it in my washing machine on spin cycle. (laughs) Oh, okay. Uh, cool. Spin out as much mo- uh, as much moisture as possible, and then and then we get to braining it, and we brain it, 
and anywhere that I put brain on that skin side needs to be protected from air because I want it to penetrate fully into the skin. So I will fold it in half, make sure that there's no skin um, exposed to the air. Otherwise that brain solution just dries on top of it and it's not actually penetrating. And I let that sit overnight. So timing's a, a bit of an issue. You have to be conscious of when you're starting each step and how long it's gonna take. But um, then by morning, first thing in the morning, I can rack it up on the frame. So um, yeah, once it's up on the frame, then it's ready to start drying. And as it's drying, it's the same as the small animals. I need to stretch it and break those skin fibers apart to get it to be extra soft uh, leather. And, um, and I actually use like a giant wooden spoon for that. So I do all of my large hide working up on the frame. I don't, okay. I don't really run it over a cable or um, anything like that. That's a lot of extra effort. So the more work I can do at that critical stage, uh, right before it's fully dry, and I'm able to get it to stretch apart, um, I do all the work up on the frame to get it extra soft. And then, of course, once it's fully dry, then I can work on the wool side or the hair side, uh, and then we smoke it, and essentially it's done. That's a okay. wow. version. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah I know. We're, yeah, I know we could get in the weeds yeah. on all the, the, the bits and pieces. Um, what does your smoking situation look like? Is it just like a regular smoker, like for meat? No. Uh, well, most people's meat smokers are coated in some stickiness. So um, yeah. we we avoid that. So what I do, um, you, can either, you can go real traditional with a bed of coals and some smoke wood. Um. Honestly, for the volume that I'm doing it, I, I do cheat a little bit. I'll use my electric hot plate and a cast iron pan. And um, any, anywhere you can suspend your hide, if it's, uh, if it's a, like a sheepskin, you can even get like a laundry rack and just like put your smoker underneath as long as it's not too hot for the hide. Like if you put your hand under the hide and it's too hot for your hand, it's too hot for the hide. Uh, okay. Yeah, just anything to kind of enclose that smoke. So like sometimes I have like a tripod over my little smoker and um, and my canvas cloth and I just wrap it. So then that holds the smoke. Small animals and sheep. Uh, I smoke for about half hour, 45 minutes with a good heavy rolling smoke. And, okay. and you only want to use hardwoods. Don't use anything with a pit, pitch or a sap because that can potentially transfer onto your leather and that ruins your hide. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I was picturing like, I like how it sounds simple. It sounds like you could create that setup at home versus Absolutely. having, I was picturing how to go buy like a hide smoker. If that yep. is the thing, I'd probably not, but that's, no. it's not, com not as complicated as I thought. Yeah. No, there's okay. uh, uh, I've had a lot of different setups and honestly, like I, I just got a permanent big smoker and I can fit like 12 coyotes in there all at one time. Um, only because I've been traveling around. So I've been using actually the laundry rack method, which it, people laugh at, but it folds flat and I can pack it in my vehicle with me. So absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's brilliant. Use, use what you have. Okay. Yes. Um, what, so with, as far as the rack that you're talking about, is that something that people could build or is that you need to go buy it? No, uh, an official have, rack. You can absolutely build it. Yeah. Why not okay. um, build a shelf with like some wire so that it's not stopping the smoke from actually penetrating into the leather. You don't want anything to inhibit that smoke hitting the skin side of the hide. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's no reason okay. why you can't build it. And what about the frame? Maybe I called it the wrong thing. The is it the the frame that you stretch on, like for oh. a larger hide? Okay, that, that, that's a called that's a frame, just like, right? Two, yeah, that's okay. Like two by fours, two by sixes. You want to have some cross bracing in there, especially for the really large hides, because they they'll pull on it and warp the wood a great deal. Okay. Yeah, but you could. But DIY that? Uh, I DIY all of mine. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, 
And that's what I was starting to gather as I was looking at all these different people talking about it. I realized there, there was lots of stuff you could buy, but I'm like, people have done this for thousands of years out in the woods. So I'm like, there's gotta be a, there's gotta be a middle ground where we yeah. don't have to get all the fancy things, but yeah. still want it functional. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can get real traditional with it and you can just get logs and use that as your frame. Um, I like two by fours because I can take them apart and stack them and, you know, be a little bit more organized with it. But uh, yeah, there's no reason uh, salvage materials repurposed. Um, we're playing with dead things, really. So it doesn't yeah. have to be fancy. <laughs> yeah. No, I like that. Okay. Um, what? So I, do you do primarily hair on if someone didn't want hair on? Is is that something that is easy to do at home or is that like a whole nother uh, it, wax? Uh, it's a whole nother process. Uh, it is still easy to do at home. There's no reason why you can't. So yeah, we have like the small animal hair on first. We have like the medium to large hair on, which is like sheep and deer um, hair off, which is leather. Um, we just take that to a rawhide state and rawhide is really great for drums. It's actually not tanned mm -hmm. at all. Um, oh. like lampshades. Um, but after the hair has been removed from the hide and, uh, and it's been dried, we can actually rehydrate it in a brain solution and then tan it just the same. But we actually... Uh, for deer, because they dry out so fast, we don't even put them up on a frame. We literally are just going to stretch them apart as they dry. And that's going to give us the best results. Okay. And yeah. so which, oh, sorry. Um, at which part of the process would you take off the hair? Is that in the early, like when you're doing that initial membrane scrape? Is that when you do the hair or is that coming somewhere else? Um, yeah, that that's, that's going to come right after we flush. So we flush it. And uh, there's two different methods for dehairing. You can do a dry method or a wet method. Um, it really depends on what your end result is, on which one's going to be more ideal for you. Yeah. But the wet method takes like an extra five to seven days. Um, and then the dry method is literally just scraping the hair off dry. Um, and that's just going to depend on how fast you work. Okay, sure. Yeah. I imagine that takes some some elbow grease. Yes, for sure. Yeah, I can just imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. So you s make sure I'm understanding this correctly. The rawhide is, so if you did the fleshing and you did the hair, yeah. then I would have rawhide at that yeah. point or. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Once it dries, then, then it's rawhide. So if, okay. if you want it, um, want it to be rawhide, then you would want it to dry on a frame. So it dries flat. Um, sure. Yeah. And you can roll it up later. Uh, the thing with hides is like with the humidity level in the air, they'll pick up that moisture. So sometimes they'll get flexible and you can actually roll them up and tie them or they'll take shape of wherever they're being stored. Okay. And then, so if we take, so that's raw hide. And then if we continue down the process you highlighted earlier, that was where we would turn, we'd end up with leather yes. if we had taken the hair off. Okay. Cause yeah. I've, I know it's so, so silly. Like I know what leather is. I know what rawhide is, but I never thought about where does it, the process right. is stop and end for each part. So I'm still yeah. trying to sort that all out. Yeah. So um, rawhide's really just like leather that hasn't actually been tanned yet. Okay. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I have one, I have one child who has started wanting to learn how to braid rawhide and I have another child who's wanting to learn leather work. And so my husband and I were like, well, this'll be great because we can get our hides but then we're like, wait, where do we, where does the raw hide come in? Where does the leather come in? And how are we going to get them their raw material? So now, I mean, it's a ways down the road, yeah. but now it's a little bit clear. Okay. Um, awesome. That is, I feel like I have a much better yes. big picture grasp of, of the process. Absolutely. Um, you know, like there's so much information out there and with all of my workshops, like um, even though there's different processes, uh, your core steps are still the same. It's just requiring maybe a different method or technique or tools and equipment for each um, different type of hide that you're tanning. So uh, the steps still remain the same. Yeah. And I'm sure it's like, it reminds me a lot of the other traditional skills I've learned over the years. You just kind of have to learn the science behind it yeah. kind of and where the things come in and you can start figuring out what you can switch and trade and change. But yeah, there's that initial learning process. That's always a little overwhelming at the beginning. It sure is overwhelming. Yeah. Everybody yeah. claims to be an expert. 
Oh, for sure. Yes. <laughs> that's, I, I love the internet. I also hate the internet for that reason. Yeah. Cause it, it connects us with the information, but it also is sometimes the information is not always great. Yeah. Um, or you gotta complete, read through, right? They, yes. They or complete. I know. <laughs> Exactly. And you're like, I think something's missing. Um, yes. So what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see beginners making or some of the biggest pitfalls or troubleshooting that people run into? Uh, hide preparation, actually. Uh, they don't get it frozen right away. They don't salt it uh, or salt it uh, properly. You get fly strike um, and hair slip and uh, some really smelly, yucky situations um i'm not in the business of tanning anything that's rotting uh i don't yeah. preserve anything rotten so uh yeah my my biggest educator is on the hide handling and prep and the preservation options right so yes if if you're pressed for time and you have the freezer space just throw it in the freezer um but then you still have to be mindful like if it's a really big woolly sheep, um, you want to actually fold it like hair to hair instead of the hair on the outside. Everybody wants to make it look pretty. Oh, but that yeah. that hair in wool is an insulator, right? So mm -hmm. it so the heat stays. Yeah. So it's yeah. not actually freezing probably as fast as you think it is. So depending on the time of year or your climate, um, those can all play a factor, especially um, doing hair on hair on is a lot more challenging. Uh, it's not as forgiving in terms of the spoilage issue or just yeah. in general. Uh, yeah, because, okay. um, you're, you're going to see, uh, the hair just start like wiping right out of the hide and, uh, that's, ah. just, that's decomposition and yeah, you'll just end up with like these big bald patches. Um, and yeah, it just, it wasn't, ha it wasn't preserved fast enough after it came off the animal. Okay. How, yeah. I know it depends on weather and heat. How much time would you say you have once an animal is, um, pro processed and the hide is uh, off? If it, if it's cool, uh, I, I would like to see them be salted or frozen within a day. Yeah. Okay. If it's summertime, sure. it's a lot shorter because the flies yeah. are going to start landing on it. So just, I mean, keep that. Yeah. As quick as it'll take flies to lay eggs on it. Yeah. Which isn't very long. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Okay. And are you just using regular salt or is there a special tanning salt? Um, no. Uh, I mean, I guess it's like special tanning salt. It has to be plain salt, just like fine grain, plain white salt, no added selenium or minerals. Um, rock salt is an absolute no go. Uh, rock salt oh, okay. is too big. It allows too much airflow and will not inhibit the decomposition process. That makes sense. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So just so a fine, fine natural yeah. salt. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then I think one of my final questions, uh, is if someone, or where could someone get hides? Let's say they're, they don't have animals that they're yeah. raising themselves or hunting. Do you have any tricks? Oh, tricks. Yeah, actually, <laughs> uh, reach out to your social media or like your local hunting groups, especially on Facebook. Um, you know, like it is a big deal to haul say an elk hide out of the bush right that's why a lot of hunters don't um but make friends with your local farmers you know um even like maybe some of the larger but still family owned uh farms and ranches everybody has animals that um emergency have to be dispatched right nobody was expecting it um, if you're willing to come out and skin it, you can probably keep that hide and head. Um, also like anybody that has like stillborn lambs, right. To keep in that starting small, um, or like dairy farms, right. With those, um, you know, lack of a better term, dead stock, um, yeah. you, you are kind of doing them a favor, right. So get creative with it, figure out who's going to have, you know, excess, of some unfortunate passings and, um, mm -hmm. you know, take that as an opportunity to not only help them out, uh, but also maybe honor that life, give it a purpose that it wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. I, I like that. Yeah. Here's a, here's a random question that that brought up. Um, 
just in terms of cattle in size, if we, cause we calve in the spring and we inevitably have loss, it just happens. Um, yeah. So if you had a calf yes. that you were able to skin, it, would that be more manageable for a beginner? Yeah. Cause it's more sheep size. Okay. Yeah, so I could do absolutely. that with the cattle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I might. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And not only that, um, like they're, they're unique. They're darn cute to have a mini cow. Hide, yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, they are. Um, and that, yeah, cat, when the calves, when you lose them, it does feel like a waste. So I feel like that would be a way to, to honor. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. I like that. I like that. Okay. So hunting groups, get to know farmers. Yeah. Think outside the box. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey everyone. I wanted to interrupt this episode for just a second to talk about my latest obsession. And that is beef tallow, believe it or not. Um, so I've been using tallow to cook with for quite a few years, but in the last couple of years, I've started using it on my skin and I kind of fell in love with it all over again. So prior to my beef tallow renaissance, I was using all the fancy like skincare products that they tell you, you have to have, you know, you got the eye creams and the serums and the tighteners and the toners and all these fancy things. And then I decided to maybe rethink that and take a little bit more of an old fashioned approach. And I asked myself, what would our ancestors have used before we had all these marketers telling us we had to use all these fancy, expensive things? And that kind of took me down this road towards animal fats, because not only are they super sustainable, but they just make sense since they match the composition of our skin. And I can personally attest that my skin absolutely loves it. Like it's never been happier. Um, I get comments on my skin all the time. I actually had my makeup done recently by a professional. Um, and as she was doing my makeup, she kept commenting. She's like, your skin is so happy and it's so well moisturized. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, um, beef tallow. She was not expecting me to say that, but it was pretty cool that she said, you know, normally I see people from dry climates like you and their skin is just really thirsty and yours is just the opposite. It's really happy. Um, so it's pretty cool that beef tallow, this old fashioned solution can work so very well and keep our skin super happy and healthy without a bunch of added chemicals and seed oils. And my very favorite place to get all of my beef tallow skincare products is Tubes & Co. Um, they are a small homestead family who recognize this need for skincare products and makeup that didn't have all the junky, toxic ingredients in them. And they stepped up and they have taken off in recent years just because their products are so amazing. So right now I'm wearing Tubes & Co. mascara and Tubes & Co. tinted tallow lip balm. And I have tallow on as a moisturizer. And I absolutely love not only their company, but their products just because they have real recognizable ingredients. Um, and they work really, really well. It, they're a high quality product. It's a great experience using them. And my skin has never been happier. So I'm thrilled to have a coupon code for Tubes & Co. for you today. If you type in the code HOMESTEAD, uh, when you check out over on their website, you'll save 15% on your order. And if you'd like to go shopping, just head on over to the prairiehomestead.com slash makeup, and you can see all they have to offer, not just the tallow products, but they also have all those makeups. They have deodorants, um, cleansers, and things like that. So I can't wait for you to rethink your skincare in an old-fashioned way, and I think it's a wonderful place where we can really embrace this idea of looking to the past to move forward. So check it on out. Tubes & Co. over at theprairiehomestead.com slash makeup. Now back to our episode. Uh, really like the problem is the solution, right? And uh, with tanning, it's full circle. So you really kind of, you got to take the good with the bad or the bad creates the good in this case, right? Um, something right. so beautiful can come from something so tragic. Um, and yeah, if if you're able to, do good and give back in that way. Um, yeah, you can find a way to take somebody's problem and give it a whole different direction. Yeah, I really like that. And I think that maybe if people are feeling squeamish because there is, you're are handling, you know, dead animals, I think it's that perspective shift. Right. You know, um, that, that brings up like with skinning. So, so with these animals, like say, say a farmer or rancher wants to donate like a whole, um, 
castaway animal. Um, I recommend freezing it first and then um, thaw it for a couple days, room temperature, and then skin it. You're not gonna have the blood. It's not gonna be messy, really. Yeah, oh, it's okay. actually very clean uh, to do it that way. That's how I do all of my coyotes. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I still have a tarp underneath to catch anything that might drip, but um, as a rule, it's really clean. So yeah, you're not, it's not really squeamish at all. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So you freeze the whole thaw completely and then hang up and start the skin yeah. process. You don't even have to necessarily thaw it completely because the skin you'll, you'll feel, um, get soft. Right. But, uh, sure. like the very core might still be frozen or like fridge temperature, okay. which is good. But yeah, as, as soon as you can start getting that hide off, then it's fine. But that kind of, it keeps everything where, where it's supposed to be inside. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. A yeah. Lot, yeah. A lot less messy. Okay. That's a great tip. Uh, yeah. That's, that's super helpful. Okay. Um, I have all these plans. This is what happens good. when I have these good podcast episodes. I just get so excited <laughs> with all the ideas. Okay. Um, anything else we miss that you would want to pass along to someone who is interested in this? Um, anything else? Uh, you can do it. You know, like, uh, don't get discouraged just because you might fail. You're probably going to fail the first couple times, but even sure. if you fail, um, tanning is pretty forgiving. If, if you have a solid understanding of each step and why you're doing it, you can back up and, you know, redo a step, um, or like, there's always some kind of troubleshooting where you can probably still save it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that brings me to my, I'm actually really excited. Share your resources with us. Cause I know you have so many options. Yes. Um, I'm yeah. Tell so, us where to go. Uh, of course I have all of my in-person workshops. Uh, I do educational presentations at schools. Um, pretty much if, if somebody wants me to come out in person, hit me up, I will create a presentation that goes over everything that's age appropriate or right know my audience okay uh, awesome and what can you um I don't know if I asked you what part of Canada you're in just in case I because I have Canadian yeah. listeners in case they're in your area uh I I am in Alberta but I will travel okay. um all western provinces so BC Alberta and Saskatchewan um I also have uh just for you actually all of my workshops are now web-based so Yay. those are dropping specifically for this podcast Oh, awesome. Yeah. And so this is something that was one of my questions. And I assumed I kind of knew the answer, but like, you can yeah. learn this online. If we can't yeah. find someone, if I can't find someone local to mentor, Absolutely. I could feasibly learn it from videos. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, and that's my effort to be more accessible, you know, because there's, it's hard to get off the farm, you know, you have family, um, not everybody can come to me. Very few people can come to me. So that's why, um, I really open myself up to travel. Um, but even more so, I am getting more of an international audience asking for the information and I can't answer everybody all at once. So I do have, of course, years of media that I have now compiled. It's part of the course. So there's video and pictures. Um, yeah, it's um, it's a really great resource. Yay. And where, where do people go to find that? Uh, that's going to be on, on, on the website. You can go to wildfiber.ca or prairierosskills.ca. Okay. Awesome. And we will put those links in the show notes sure. for everyone so they can find those. Okay. Prairie Rose Skills. Fabulous. Um, well, I'm excited to dive in. I know you're on Instagram too, yes. right? Because that's, yeah, that's where I connected with you originally was Instagram. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wild Fiber Tannery on Instagram. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, I'm excited. I know, I feel like this is a, a, well, at least in my circles, this is a, a topic of the homesteading old fashioned lifestyle that a lot of people just haven't, we haven't thought about it. We haven't dove in, we haven't considered it. So I think this is so important just so we honor the full life of the animal. We use all the parts. If we're going to um, harvest animals, I think we need to use all the pieces as much as possible. And I think this is, at least for me, it feels like that next um, level up the next step up of learning another skill that's so cool and so timeless, but also really useful. So really I'm useful, really valuable too. Uh, if, if you have a source for it and you really love it, go hit it hard. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, 
thank you so much. This Thanks. was so enlightening. And um, I'm going to go, I'm going to be at your first one in your new course area because I'm pumped to, to dive in. So <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.